this is uh, the our kind of current uh, uh, corporate uh, 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 marketing stuff. And today I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of the things that are mentioned there um, in the in the buzzwords. Right, um, primarily. I'm going to talk about extracting things and connecting them, but also a little bit about matching them. And uh, which things am I extracting and connecting? Uh, well, uh, this uh, many years ago, hyperbole and a half drew a remarkably accurate picture of our typical customer. Um, there are three things to note um, that uh, it says things. It doesn't say strings because our customers don't really care about strings. They don't really care about the text. They care about their domain, right? And so this is what they come to us for, um, to help them understand their domain, understand the text in their domain. Um, it says all the things, um, but as it turns out, um, most customers aren't actually interested in all the things they just think they are. Um, and the things they're most interested in most often are the named things and the new things, right? So um, things that they already know about, but they'd like to track, and things that they don't know about now um, that they'd like to find out about. Um, and I think that they sometimes, initially at least, have a poor idea of why they want the things that they want, even when we figure them out. What, what are they actually going to do with them? Um, they just believe that um, having, having access to them or having them is going to help them in some way. Um, and that's something that we often end up um, helping them with too. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the company and myself. I'm going to motivate this move from strings to things. Um, I'm going to review a couple of enabling technologies. And for many of you, this may be a many times told tale. I'll keep it short. But there's a new thing that we've uh, developed recently that I'm going to talk about. Um, entity extraction, finding names in the text and classifying them. Um, and then the new thing is resolution, which is connecting the names together and to things via proxies like uh, knowledge sources like Wikipedia. Um, and then I'm going to give you three examples of things you can do. But actually, this is one long example, um, which is a kind of um, search entity, entity search-based example, which illustrates um, how enriched typing um, can help you um, uh, when you're searching for specific things, when you have complex searches, um, and how correction um, of those um, decisions might actually help improve accuracy over time. Is that buzzing me? Yeah. Okay. So um, the, two, the the latter two examples are really speculations, um, but they're they're well grounded um, and in uh, in practice in other areas, uh, particularly in information retrieval. So getting additional high quality enrichments from the knowledge sources, um, either in the nodes that you're retrieving um, or from nearby uh, neighborhood um, and using that nearby neighborhood to recognize anomalies, um, you know, by establishing a rich norm. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about I say more about that as I go on. So, um, who's basis technology? What do they do? They essentially do this. They take text, um, unstructured text that is not little not little blobs that are already well formed um, in databases, um, but you know prose, um, longer runs of text, and they add structure to them, um, and they do so across languages. Um, and um, the kinds of enrichments they add include linguistic structure itself, um, annotations of entity types, um, um, talking about differentiating one person from another, um, matching in one language to another language. You can see many of these phenomena are represented in the little pictures there. Um, so uh, that's actually what we do. I guess I'd say there are um, three things that, if I had to say this, the strengths of the company, it would be that we have probably the broadest language coverage in the market. Um, the quality is such that many of the people who you would think of as text analytics providers have us underneath the hood, including our hosts this evening. Um, and uh, I think the last strength would be, or uh, the strongest part other than those things, would be that we have very adaptable tools that you can take them and you can adapt them to your particular domain um, you know, a lot more simply than, for example, taking the open source stuff off the shelf and then spending a long time doing that work, because we've already done some of it for you, um, and also because uh, we have specific tooling and techniques that will um, help you work on that. Additional um, annotations. So I'm the product manager or director of product management for text analytics, and I take care of these three um, areas of uh, our work. So um, I, I take care of three different areas of products. Um, Rosette 
the text analytics suite all the way from tokenization to entity resolution. Um, I take care of Highlight, which is an, an assisted translation platform, uh, which is currently mostly used inside government, inside the intelligence community. Uh, and I look after Odyssey, which is uh, both a pipeline um, and a workflow framework for building applications that use these uh, text analytics tools. And the example I'm going to show you um, uses um, the Odyssey reference application that we built to demonstrate um, some of the things that we can do. So trying to motivate the um, uh, this jump from strings to things, right? So people type in keywords, and that's, string, that's a, a canonical example of strings, right? They're thinking about the text. And when someone is querying using a strings mentality, they have to add um, you know, qualifiers, well, I want star S or et cetera. So people, people have learned to um, express um, variation, if you like, um, using operators for search. And um, it, it's kind of clunky because it means that um, you end up spending a lot of time specifying variation that uh, machines are very good at picking up, right? So that's one of the um, initial motivations. Um, and you know, uh, these guys care, right? So Facebook, Bing, Google, Twitter, etc. They're all trying to do something to make it easier um, to deal with the amount of variation um, in the um, very large data sets that, that they're allowing you to search and, um, and, dis and discover. And you probably see that you've probably seen this um, kind of interface like every day uh, for a large part of your life. And that bit on the right hand side uh, only relatively recently appeared, right? Um, these entity cards. Um, and you see they're remarkably similar between the two um, biggies here, right? And that's because it establishes some kind of dialogue, right, with the user in that static presentation um, and also in the dynamic suggestion um, uh, of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, things that you're, you might be querying for. So you can see, you know, also try is, you know, did you really mean that? The, um, what is it, right-hand side entity, I think you meant this, here's more information. Um, what is it, uh, digressive suggestion um, that you can pick up uh, and you can follow a path through um, to uh, um, achieve a, a search result you might otherwise not have um, uh, originally intended, right? Um, and who can know the, the mind of Face Bingler? Um, what is it, but uh, you see the difference here. Um, both of the entity cards seem to be uh, initially focused on women, but uh, um, at, at least um, Bing thinks that uh, Tiger Woods is a romantic or is connected with romance. Uh, I wouldn't have initially said that was my, I wouldn't have initially said that was Tiger Woods' strong suite. Um, so in any case, this um, is a much richer search experience, right? And it's enabled by um, connecting these strings with um, entities, right? In a in, in this case, in both cases, I guess, some kind of graph structure, right? But if I typed in something less than Tiger Woods, like Tiger Wood, et cetera, I'd still have achieved this, um, this, this card presentation, right? Um, because it's taking this variation and normalizing it to this um, entity and giving me this display because it's the most likely thing that I wanted. Um, and this additional information is driven from that um, knowledge structure. Um, so that's great. Um, but sometimes you don't, you didn't really want Tiger Woods, and uh, that that directedness in the search, um, what is it, uh, over biasing, if you like, to the things that are popular, um, what is it, sometimes comes a cropper. Uh, I might have meant a tiger in the woods. I might have meant a wooden tiger, um, and if I were on Etsy, I'd probably mean the middle one. Um, and if I were somewhere else, I might be looking for that kind of image. Um, so it's not. I, it's not an unalloyed good um, to um, be normalizing to this graph. However, um, where it might have um, better, uh, you know, more, uh, how can I put it, uh, more easily understood or accepted um, uh, benefit would be in trying to uh, express the complex information need, for example, that's in this um, long query at the bottom. Uh, serial interactions with France that seem really important this month um, are, I mean, that's a very complex set of uh, search criteria, right? Um, and people do type this kind of thing in, right? Um, and so at the very least, um, trying to resolve the things that are in that uh, uh, request um, would be a start. So there, remember I told you there are two steps in traditional um, you know, entity resolution or getting from strings to things. And the first one is to actually get the things, the mentions of the things in the text. Right? So this is one of my favorite little things um, from 
New York Magazine a little while ago. Um, it's an exceptionally bizarre place, um, North Korea, and uh, the fact that, that one of their most popular songs would be um, Excellent Horse Like Lady um, is uh, even more bizarre. So um, apparently, um, uh, that singer used to be um, the uh, girlfriend of the leader, uh, and um, they're wondering whether or not he had her executed um, because her, her, his now current wife was displeased by that. So um, you can see that uh, using a standard technique, you can pick up um, names of people, places, and organizations. And how this is done essentially is, um, you know, uh, I would have several things uh, interacting to um, bring me this kind of result. So it would be a statistical model, which looks at very small features like um, words before and after. It might look at um, part of speech tags. It might, it might look at things in a list. Um, it might look at things um, in a list of patterns that I can define. Um, but there are several different models, several different ways of representing the knowledge that I have uh, to go into um, finding these pieces. Right? And you'll note that um, it's not picking out um, pronouns, right? It's just picking out named mentions, right? Um, so this is kind of bog standard idea of um, named entity recognition. Um, and what we're actually picking out here are um, mentions. They're not entities yet. They're just little bits of text, just little strings um, that may be related to one another, may be related to things in the world. So these are all the um, dimensions we like extracted out and um, they've been typed. Um, and the colors represent the types. Um, and there, there are some that are similar to others. Um, and so we might be able to group them just by, looking at how, just by seeing how similar they are as little snippets. Um, and that kind, that's a kind of very rough co-reference resolution. Again, no anaphora, no pronouns. Um, but um, that's a, a very standard uh, way of, of grouping things. So. I can extract things like this, and I can group them, and that gives me a, a rough sense of the things in the document, right? But it's not a very good one. Um, you can see all it's really doing is collapsing some spelling variation, um, and it's really not looking at much in the way of, uh, of context. So again, this is just a, 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 to um, pick up on the, um, to kind of come around to all the things that were involved in that. Right, I take the input text, and I have some tag text that I've taken, um, large numbers of documents which I've had hand annotated and saying, this is a name, this is a name, this is a name, and or this is a person, this is a location, this is a thing. And these small scale features, right, like the words before it, the words after it, etc. Language has this amazing, um, what is it, tendency um, to um, be quite regular around names. Um, and so, and in fact, the names themselves have certain structure. And so you can type them roughly by looking at the name structure and the surroundings, and you can usually find them very reliably by looking at those kinds of things. But really, um, the most powerful part of that is the teal colored thing, the supervised model, which is taking that information in and using it to, to find the bounds, right? Um, the next most powerful thing is actually the user-defined list, the knowledge that's given in gazetteers, these long lists of words and names and so on that um, you know, you'll, you'll find in any one of these um, tools, right? Um, pattern matching is probably um, uh, the next most powerful. Um, but the reason I've put this diagram up is to say a little bit about um, something specific that we've added. Um, which is uh, an unsupervised model, which is something that just consumes a large amount of text um, that hasn't been annotated from the customer's domain um, and merges it with the supervised model to um, move it a little towards the, uh, the customer's text type. So the idea here is that um, uh, if I'm, uh, given that the original annotations, the tag texts are typically in news and blogs and so on, and they may have been built some time ago, um, and there may have been vocabulary shift generally, or a person may be um, taking information from a, um, you know, a, a blog or a different uh, uh, text type that's quite far from that genre. Um, and the vocabulary itself and the turns of phrase um, you know, are related, um, but you need to make that relation. So the way that someone speaks about uh, diseases in general text and the way that they speak about them in, in clinical text, they're different. Um, but you can, you can, you can associate the, the, the context by consuming a lot of this text, clustering it a certain way, and then relating it to the text you've already tagged. Um, so the upshot of that is you can take something off the shelf, 
you can take a large amount of your text, you can consume it, and the model will perform slightly better without much effort from you. Um, additional work done on the um, left-hand side here is to take all these individual recognizers um, and to adjudicate between them uh, when one says that this span is a name, another one says that no, it's not, there's kind of overlaps. Um, there are additional rules that you can express here um, to, to tune it, right? Um, joining would be another one where I've recognized two, um, but really they, I think they should be together and you can specify um, either rules or you can build second order models over there and what you get is annotated text. And the annotated text is what we just saw in the previous slide. Just these are the names, these are the strings. Um, and that uh, joining can also mean um, saying that this, this, this snippet of text and this snippet of text are kind of the same, you know, adding that basic co-reference resolution. So, um, entity resolution. Now I've got my mentions, right, out of the text. Um, how do I get them attached um, to my knowledge sources, right, uh, to the representations of the things in the world, the proxies? So this is, this is marketing level stuff, but it, uh, it gives you a, a, an initial idea, and then I'll go on to fill it in. So this is the same document in a number of different languages. Um, and these are some entities that you might have picked up, um, an organization, a couple of people, um, and so on. And then um, it's doing two things. It's um, identifying known entities. So in Wikipedia, I know that there are the two bushes. Uh, I want to say right up front, um, there's so little context here uh, that this would, never be, uh, this would never be recognized. This is illustrative purposes only. I guess that's where it says closed circuit professional driver. Um, it's even more of a lie than that. Um, so, but the idea here is it illustrates the, um, the purpose, right? You want to take things that you know um, and connect them up. Um, and then you want to discover new names in documents that you might not have um, in your knowledge sources. Um, now, what this is missing is this crucial, crucial element of, there's a lot of documents here and there are a lot of Albertos mentioned, right? Uh, and there are these three Albertos that they could be talking about. Um, and there's lots of variation here, Alberto M. Fernandez, Alberto Fernandez, etc. misspellings. Um, which of these three fellows is any given mention of Alberto Fernandez, right? Um, now, um, not only will a single Alberto Fernandez have his name um, with a great set of variation, but you know the variation across the Alberto Fernandez is also good. Is also difficult to deal with. So, um, one thing you can do is you can look at the context around them, right? And you can see that there, two are quite similar actors, right, um, at the top. Um, he's a U.S. ambassador and a chief of cabinet of Argentina, right? These are political actors. Quite difficult to tell them apart. But um, you can imagine contexts in which one is mentioned and the other is not, right? And you can imagine the kind of context that would allow you to differentiate those two people. Um, uh, the third, Alberto Fernandez, is a cyclist, right? Um, he would mention, in, you'd imagine, very different contexts, right? So they'll mention things like Tour de France or, um, you know, Vuelta. Uh, and they're not going to mention those things in these two politicians unless they were attending and cutting, cutting ribbons, right? So one of the things you can do if you can use that context to point to the right Alberto Fernandez, right, is um, use the information that's in um, the knowledge source that you resolve to. Um, and so you can start to ans answer questions like, are any of the people that, men that are mentioned in these documents as Alberto Fernandez sportsmen? Oh, yes, one of them is. Um, what's the ratio of politicians to sportsmen? You know, simple um, quantitative questions that you can answer from information that you can get directly um, from the, the nodes in the, um, in the knowledge source. And you can ask more complicated questions like, you know, does any of them have a nickname El Galeta? Turns out that, um, that uh, Alberto Fernandez, that's the cyclist's father was also a cyclist. And so it wasn't his nickname, it was his dad's nickname. So um, there are questions there. So I also wanted to take a step back and say that this kind of unstructured to structured um, or semi-structured resolution isn't just a text problem. Right? Um, it's a, it can be an image problem and a, um, and a video problem too. And so what you've got here are three different presentations of a, um, of a logo. Um, which you could consider to be mentions, right, of uh, Manchester United, right? Always nice to have a little bit of assisted self-mutilation in there um, with the person getting the tattoo. Um, but you can see there's an old style um, 
uh, uh, logo, the more modern one, but on in, in a background that you wouldn't have expected, um, and then the, the tattoo. And these are all obscured. And this came to me when we, uh, our friends at Ditto came around to give us a, um, a presentation about their technology and how the amazing variation, um, what is it that they can um, abstract away um, in order to uh, get to, uh, back to these logos and so on and connect up um, these logos, these presentations with a particular entity. Right? Just to illustrate another um, problem that the, uh, the first slide about this illustrates is the unknown entities right? in another, in another um, medium. And this flag started to appear um, you know, in lots of places very recently, right? And it didn't really have an association until you know a few months ago, let's say, right? At least not in our consciousness. Um, so one of the things you'll see is, and you know, many documents will contain mentions of things that are uh, you know never before mentioned, but you see lots of mentions of them, right? And you start to associate those mentions together. That becomes what you might call the ghost, right? So here, um, uh, you know, a little while ago, for example. Um, these flags um, would not have meant anything, right? But what we do know is that they're very similar to one another, right? And so we should say, these similar things should be clustered together, and maybe we should think about what that refers to, right? Um, so that so-called ghost case. So how is this resolution done? Um, now, in an abstract sense, I have to start from the knowledge sources, right? Um, and these are represented by these, these Wikipedia pages. Essentially, they could be any structured or semi-structured or unstructured sources that you want. Um, and what you do is you extract information which is good for matching, right? Which is going to be discriminative um, of the things that you're trying to pick out, right? And when I say that, I mean, if you look at any um, uh, Wikipedia page or Wikidata entry, right, for a person, um, they will typically have the canonical sentence, the mention of that person in the first sentence, right, will contain things like their name in a native script, their job, which country they work in, you know, where they were born, things like this, right? So take Obama, um, he, he would have president, US, the number of president that he was, etc. in this canonical mention. These are excellent discriminators for this, this Obama versus some other Obama, right? Um, so in addition, you have info box structured information which you can use um, to do that discrimination. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're or extracting or digesting um, the, the knowledge um, for two purposes, one for matching and one for later retrieval. So for example, it might not be useful um, to know what uh, um, uh, Barack Obama's um, family situation is, right? Um, but it might be for matching purposes, but it might be useful for um, uh, informational purposes later on. So you might want to abstract some information for matching and some for later retrieval. Um, and what it does is essentially is it puts these um, entities into a, a space, right? So you can imagine a multi-dimensional space in which, you know, people are over in one bit, um, places are over in another, um, and the places that are like one another are closer and so on. So it's a very rough spatial analogy, um, and it compresses a great deal of variation in many dimensions, but that's, that's roughly what's happening. So take the, take the um, uh, uh, article, the, the little article that we were talking about before. And I'll take four of these what we called co-reference chains, right? These little associated bits of text, right? And by putting that circle around them, I mean I've now added in the context right around them. So that's some of the words to the left, some of the words to the right, some of the words in the title, etc. right? You know, um, these are all useful for figuring out which, you know, uh, Kim Jong-il, etc. these things really are. Um, and uh, I've superimposed them um, in the matching space um, on top of the things that we got from the knowledge base, right? And you can see that um, uh, Ri Solju is in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's nothing matching there. Um, uh, Hyun Song Wall is uh, the mentions of her are um, quite overlapping with the um, the entity Hyun Song Wall, um, and so you can imagine what would be uh, what would be the outcome. So. That come, when we scored them was um, that Hyun Sung Wall was closest to um, that entity in the knowledge base. Um, we saw you didn't match anything um, uh, better than the null entity, let's say, the, the, the blank, right? Um, and the other two um, uh, matched, but the um, mention of Chosun, which um, is, there's a little bit of ambiguity there between the um, Place, which is called Joseon, right? The, which was a historic name for that part of um, uh, Korea, um, and uh, Joseon Ilbo, which is the 
news agency, right? And the second mention of Chosen Ilbo is just Chosun, right? But it's right next to Korea and so on. And so um, it matched the wrong thing here. So what we've got is an opportunity to correct it um, and, um, uh, and an indication that we're missing some information in the knowledge base, right? And that little ghosty symbol is to indicate that that's what it's called, a ghost. So how is this done? I think I've, I've given a pretty um, good telegraphing, if you like. So I take the entity mentioned, a little bit of text, and the context around it, some words, etc. Um, and I initially just use the name, and I try to find candidates, right? So I'm going to think, I'm going to try to look for things that have ever been called by, um, you know, this little bit of text, right? And I'll get thousands of them, and then I will take that set of, um, you know, uh, results, that set of candidates, and then I'll rank them by more expensive means, right? So I'll now take into account the context around them. I'll now, now take into account the interactions between them, right? And I'm matching information that I got from um, my knowledge base with information that's in the text, right? Um, that produces a ranking of the candidates. You could take the top N, you could take the top one, um, and it will produce either a link to a known entity um, or a ghost, right? It will say, um, give you an ID for your knowledge source, um, such as a Freebase ID, um, which you can then go and query and get more information from, um, uh, or it will just give you a, a null entity thing saying that, that you need to find a, a reference for this. And by the way, what it will do, if you so wish, um, will also learn both the mentions, so the specific way of talking about this entity, and the context, right? And over time, will accumulate those um, so as to better uh, match, right? So you're, not only are you accumulating the different ways of talking about something, you're accumulating the context in which it's been seen. Right. Um, the correction is um, an important piece because you won't always get it right. Um, and another thing to mention is that obviously all this learning creates more context, right? Uh, increases the size of the um, space you have to search. Um, and so you have to be very careful, and this is part of the secret sauce about how you factor the additional evidence that you, you pull in, right? So if you just take everything, uh, then you'll end up with, you know, no runtime. It'll take forever to match anything. And if you never take anything, you'll never, you'll, if you never take any new context in, you won't learn any new stuff, right? You won't be able to match more uh, accurately. Um, so there's a distinction there between the seeded stuff, the stuff that came from the knowledge base initially, and is periodically updated, which we are, which we descent is known good. And then there's the stuff that we learn from context and the mentions that we uh, we find in the uh, in the text. Again, all linking back to the knowledge base, which has a much richer representation of this entity. So, I want to talk now about um, the the biggish example um, that I mentioned. I would go through in the in the beginning, and it's uh, it, it comes from uh, the domain which this. Uh, um, piece of technology that we built was originally designed for, right? Which is intelligent community um, gathering intelligence um, from um, uh, all and sundry text sources, including um, personal letters, etc. Um, and to understand that most of the work that we do is non-English, um, and that's a uh, um, you know, I guess there are fewer resources in certain languages than in others for uh, entity resolution, but uh, in Arabic in particular, there's not much of a Pashto Wikipedia, um, but there's a, a pretty decent Arabic Wikipedia, and so um, bear that in mind as we uh, move through. What a lot of this will rely on is, um, you know, the individual company or in, organization using this having a, a rich source of knowledge already um, that we can either use directly or that we can transform into a, a, a mode that we can use. So, <laughs> right about here, well, some, some hundred, few hundred miles away from here, um, you know, and not that long ago, some the CIA was asked, you know, um, could you tell us how likely it is that the Syrian opposition is going to use chemical weapons, um, you know, in, in this time frame, let's say. Um, and as part of building that analysis, and, uh, uh, you know, because there are Al Qaeda elements in that uh, Syrian opposition, um, Alice the analyst, this lady here at the bottom, was asked to characterize Al Qaeda's attitude to using chemical weapons against Middle Eastern governments. And this is the kind of very open ended question that analysts get asked and why there's so damn many of them, right? Um, because that's actually a very difficult thing to do, and it's certainly not something that computers are going to do anytime soon. However, they may be able to help. Um, so this is a document that Alice probably needs to read, right? And it was written a long time ago, and it was collected quite recently, um, and um, written by this fellow, and 
you can see at the top I've done, um, what is it, uh, a little bit of highlighting to illustrate uh, what to, uh, the standard technique of entity um, extraction might do um, if I have, uh, for example, defined gazetteers or I've trained on lots of text um, in Arabic uh, that mention chlorine gas and so on. It will pick those out because they're just entity types right? that I'm able to define and pick out people. Um, but the red text I've highlighted because that's the bit that the person would need to read to know uh, that this was, a mean, this was a meaningful contribution. right? So the red text is the part that a person needs to see. right? Um, the other parts are bits that machines could pick out. Right? Um, so you've got the instruments, you've got a key actor, and you've got a policy statement. Right? Um, so let me put that in context. Um, so that communication was written um, in 2007. Boots went on doors in 2011. Um, it was triaged out of a big um, set of uh, hard drives in that it was discovered you know, through meticulous reading um, that uh, this was a document that needed to be translated um, immediately, uh, among all the other things, for example, grocery, you know, grocery lists and so on. So this document was picked, it was translated. It was very likely translated using a system that we um, helped to build, um, and then it was indexed um, using um, uh, you know, techniques that I'm going to um, talk about the techniques that we've been mentioning here. Um, and now Alice has um, you know, access to this large information store. Um, that's being treated in this way. Now, this is the Artie McStrawman of the, um, you know, the querying world, right? I'll just type, well, I'll just type the things I'm interested in, right? Al Qaeda, chemical weapons, Middle East government. And that is a straw man, but it's not far off what most people do, um, you know, in terms of figuring out how to talk to the search engine in order to get the things I want, right? So I'll just type on the keywords and see what guff I get, and then I'll refine and so on and so forth, right? But these strings are just that, right? I'm not going to get Al Qaeda mentioned, in, you know, mentioned with a different spelling. I'm going to get Al Qaeda, right? If I put those keywords in, there's a little bit of variation it will pick up, but maybe not much, right? Um, certainly, the, the this length of string is going to generate a huge amount of chaff, as you all know, right? You put words like government in, you know, you're going to get an awful lot of stuff back, and probably the wrong stuff. So. This is an illustration of the kind of thing you get back. It's in the right general area, but it's not really all that illuminating. So we can go for our entity-based search, right? We can start to try to specify our information need by talking about the things that we're interested in and let the machine underneath handle all the variation um, and the, you make use of all these um, resolutions that uh, the machine did in the past, right, at index time or ingest. So specify Al-Qaeda the entity, right? I've written the string in and it said to me, did you mean this entity? And it's showing me that it has a number of mentions, however many mentions it's got, and it's showing me all the different variations, all the different ways it, it has been mentioned, right? And, and their counts. And then it's giving me some measure of the confidence or quality of that match, right? Between the, um, the mentions and that entity, given the context, right? So we've got some very high quality uh, mentions and not very many poor ones. And the reason for that is very likely that the, the passage of this document in particular, right, and the many others, have been uh, through, through the hands of people. So some of that um, annotation is going to have been done manually, right, which is high quality. Right? So we can, we can know which ones have been hand annotated and which ones have been um, annotated automatically. And we can give them different scores right, according to um, those criteria. So that's now a constraint, right? So now I have um, articles, um, documents that mention Al-Qaeda in many different ways, but are all roughly speaking about Al-Qaeda, right? Um, I can add another constraint, right? I can say there are devices, and this is the part that's, um, you know, the expansion, the extension of this um, entity-based uh, piece. You see that there's a devices uh, set entity um, group there, right? And that rich typing that we have, which is Chem W, et cetera, chemical warfare agent, right, um, is something that you can get from um, Wikipedia, right? If you look up sarin, um, you'll see somewhere in the info box or whatever, that's a chemical weapon, right? And so I can use that typing um, because I made that connection between the string sarin and the knowledge base. And then I looked in the knowledge base for what was the type there, right? I didn't have to use the guessing, um, you know, of the earlier, um, you know, less accurate um, mechanism, right? So now I can specify that as a constraint. Um, and I've done so, and my articles are now very much more likely to be um, about Al-Qaeda and mentions of um, this chemical, of chemical warfare agents. Do 
another thing, I'll say I'm only interested in um, locations in the Middle East. And you can see every location will have, you know, a hierarchy of, um, you know, both political and geographical places that it's um, associated with. And now I'm specifying the Middle East. And lastly, I'm specifying government actors, right? Because these are the people I'm interested in. You can see um, that Jalal Talbani, who was mentioned in the document that we, we saw at the beginning, the one that Alice would like to see, um, is mentioned. Um, so I had that constraint, and now I'm still, I'm, I'm getting very high quality documents. These are very likely to be things I should read, right? But I'm only interested in the very highest quality mentions of Al-Qaeda, right? Meaning essentially what I'm saying here is I only want to see the documents that have been, hand, that have been manually annotated, right, for that entity. Everything else could be automatically, but that I want to see um, hand annotated, right? So I'm constraining it to that. And then, lo and behold, my document pops to the top and I could read the original Arabic. Now, the thing is that that's not too far off what's actually going on um, under the hood when you're doing your um, entity-driven searching or digression and focusing um, when, you're, when you're interacting with Google. There's nothing you know, crazy you know, modern about this. It's just that not all of us have uh, Google's uh, throughput in terms of people clicking things. Um, and, uh, and some of us have needs that diverge from, I just want to know what's popular for this, for this group of people in the world, right? Sometimes you have needs which aren't about popularity. They're about particular um, uh, missions or um, uh, requirements, right? So as I said at the beginning, sometimes I'm looking for a wooden tiger, and sometimes I really am looking for that romantic um, that I mentioned at the beginning. So let's take a look at the one underneath here, right? Um, so it's about chemical weapons. It's about Syria. Um, you know, it's about um, what is it? To, um, you know, uh, these government actors. Um, and I'm going to go into it and take a look at the other people that are mentioned. This is just something that now I know I'm in this general area. Who are the other people involved, right? Um, who are the actors involved? And at the bottom here, you can see there's this character, Michael Lewin, right, who's with the OPCW, right? Um, and um, I want to know a little bit more about him. I've never seen him before. So I click on his entity, and oh, uh, I get this. This is a bit surprising. Uh, I know he's very unlikely to be this person, right? Um, so somewhere along the line, this has not been manually annotated. Uh, you know, the machine is, is incorrectly connected with a far more you know, a far, a far worse match, but a far more popular entity, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a balance there, right? So kind of the idea that Lindsay Lohan isn't the right person, but I don't know who is. So I'll click correct it, and it will give me other entities that um, it, it thought it might match um, along the way, right? Um, and it turns out that at the top, there's one that has the same surface form, Michael Lewin. So I'm thinking, well, that's a good, that's probably a good bet. But let me check. Um, because it might be the wrong thing. So I'm going to look at a sample document, right? I'm going to go back and say, um, you said that this Michael Lewin, you know, was something that um, I should look at. I'm going to go and look, and if it mentions he's OPCW, then I'll say, this is probably the right guy. Right? And this is a new document. This is the sample document I'm looking at. And yes, it's Michael Lewin because it was mentioning, if you look, it's mentioning OPCW elsewhere. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this is the right entity to connect up that um, bad mention to, right? So I do that, and now in my um, original document, I'm connected to Michael Lewin, the correct person, the correct entity, right? So what we saw there was um, progressive refinement using more semantic, um, what is it, concept, right? The idea that I'm really interested in this particular thing, right? And if I have a good way of connecting up strings and things, I can add additional information that will help me do that um, refinement. And then I'm using uh, uh, the mechanism of correction to um, refine that connection, right? I'm now adding information. Uh, when, I, when I hit the correct button there, I'm taking the information that was around Michael Lewin in the document that was originally linked to Lindsay Lohan, and I'm shifting it from the Lindsay Lohan, um, what is it, uh, cluster to the, um, the Michael Lewin cluster, right? So now, the next time um, we encounter um, Michael Lewin, it's much more likely uh, to link it to the correct entity, right? So the benefit of correction here is that I'm enriching um, the, both the linking model and the, um, the knowledge base. Now, taking a further step back, these are the, these are the two speculations that I'm putting in. 
Um, some knowledge sources, many, many public knowledge sources, have this rich connectivity. They're a graph, right, or something like a graph between things and concepts and, um, you know, uh, classes, if you like, right, different kinds of descriptor. And this can be incredibly useful um, for tasks other than just toodling around on it or finding out just how romantic um, Tiger Woods is, right? So uh, developers often ask for things like topics. This is in our domain. And they say, I really want topic extraction. And you know, there's many algorithms for extracting topics. Um, that would be, um, in some cases, it would be Show me the phrase that's in the document that's most, you know, most likely to be representative of the content of the document. Or it might be, show me some words or a label um, that isn't in the document but represents its content. Right? There are lots of different ways of um, caching out that term concept, uh, topics, but people ask for them all the time. Right? They're really looking for some kind of summative um, statement or um, object. Right? Um, the problem is that even advanced uh, topic extraction or construction um, algorithms, talking LDA, etc., which are very powerful, um, provide labels which um, are often howlers to um, users, right? Um, because they're statistically correct. They're not, and you can run you can run great groups of them through language models and all sorts of things to get to weed out the bad ones, to weed out the ones that people wouldn't uh, wouldn't think were good. I mean, I, I had recently a customer in Singapore. Um, say to me that um, LDA had yielded a label early adopt instead of early adopter. And he was affronted by this. And I said, well, that's just stemming somewhere along the line. But you know, that's what happens. And it's not, that's not an isolated case. So what ends up is that people get a lot of labels that they don't really um, like the look of. Um, and especially if they're being presented directly to people, it's a little less problematic if they're being used as part of a larger system. So in Watson, early adopt is going to function exactly the same way as early adopter. But if you're showing them to end users, they need to have this, this um, human curated property, if you like. Um, so better labels might be derived from either node info, so if you think about all the information in Wikipedia that specifies what kind of a thing this thing is and what things it's connected with, etc., in the info box even, right? Um, these might be better labels than many of the labels that LDA would yield right for the documents. Um, and uh, if you walk along the graph, um, especially if you do you know, a large sampling of uh, random walks, you're probably going to end up with um, you know, a, a nice good list of the things that are um, you know, associated there or would be good labels. So again, you start at Obama and you do a bunch of random walks around the graph, you're probably going to end up at US government a lot of times or um, you know, presidency or things like that. So these would be better labels. And each one of those labels has been, at some point or other, been you know, automatically extracted and curated or has been hand input, right? So that might be um, something that's uh, attractive. Now, if you go one step further, you might be able to establish some kind of norm in that same way. So running around the graph from a particular node and collecting um, what is it, the, uh, both the arcs that you go over and the nodes um, and then pruning them in specific ways right, to build a representation of what's the usual context of this entity? Right? What's the normal context of this uh, person, thing, etc.? cetera? Um, and it could be focused on other entities Right? Who are the associates right, of this person in the knowledge base? Right? Um, what types of entities are they that this person or this thing is associated with? Right? Um, and what relationships um, are, they likely to, are they most likely to be involved in? Um, and we could use these representations, um, however they're constructed, um, to affect ranking results. Right? We could um, use them to raise alerts. Right? Um, and note, again, that this is not specific to um, text. If you can get elements from images, um, you know, and low-level image recognizers for things like cats, landscapes, mountains, etc. Right? Um, these are all things which can be used to link back to either raw, raw concepts or, for example, uh, the Manchester United logo, Manchester United logo, smiling faces, you know, Brazilian flag, etc. In the same image, you know, that's a pretty rich um, set of things to go back to the graph and um, see if that's normal. The important thing about this is that establishing some kind of norm. You can pick out anomalies better. So the idea here is that um, if I know what's normal to President Obama, then if I don't, if I see something that's not in that norm, then that's probably a more interesting document, right? So the example is Samsung and smartphones. Yeah, 
another smartphone, LG and smartphones, right? You know, LG gets into the pornography business. Well, that's interesting, right? You know, why are they doing that, right? Maybe because that's where most of the money the internet's made. But uh, I think the idea there is that um, that's something which is not normal to, uh, if you start with Samsung and you can bounce around the graph for as long as you like, you're probably never gonna, never gonna end up at pornogra pornographic industry, right? So, um, so very useful, um, what is it? And uh, in IR, this is a standard um, technique for uh, finding associated terms, et cetera. Um, so again, it's not magic. It's just something that you can do. Um, and the key thing is you can't start to do all those nice things with your graph and your, uh, and your knowledge base if you can't connect the text up to it. That's why we started with this particular uh, piece of technology. So I'm just summarizing. So extraction of the resolution components like the one I showed you, the schematic of Rex, which is our Rosette extractor, and Res, Rosette Entity Resolver, can reliably connect these strings to things, or at least their proxies, right, in knowledge bases like Freebase and Wikipedia. This allows you to use existing knowledge in a, in a um, in new and you know not so new ways, right? So we can add properties like types, so chemical weapon or chemical weapons agent, right? Because we can get them from the knowledge base. We don't have to infer them from the text where they probably aren't, right? Um, and other advanced enrichments, which uh, I've given you two possible examples of. Um, and we can discover where um, existing knowledge is lacking. We can find ghosts, right? We can associate, um, you know, things that are similar and have similar, similarly mentioned and have similar contexts together, um, even if they don't have um, uh, an entity we can connect them with. And that thing-based search can allow queries to be more precise and productive. Um, you know, that means ultimately that you spend less time querying um, and you have fewer results to read. Um, and in a you know, that is why, uh, you know, Face Bingler is so interested in, in this because ultimately um, people's information needs become more, um, what is it, uh, uh, precise um, as years goes on because they realize they can get these things um, if they use this new idiom. So um, using abundant human feedback, that is any time a person, a person can see that this is not Lindsay Lohan, right? That's pretty easy to see and they can make a little correction, right? And when they make that correction, it suddenly means that some context that they probably wouldn't even have understood um, gets associated with the correct entity which means that later on, that matching is much more likely to happen. Um, and over time, you can imagine large groups of people making these small corrections, right? And it's adding nuance and subtlety um, to the um, matching um, that, that's done. But you know, these tools are like shoes, right? And this is uh, uh, Michael Jordan and um, Spike Lee. And I wonder if any of you remember, uh, what is it when they were doing the ads for Nike where it, Spike Lee's character, I think is called Mars Blackmon, right? Kept saying, is it the shoes? It's gotta be the shoes. And Michael Jordan's like, uh, no, it's not the shoes, right? So the idea is here that these are very powerful tools. Um, you know, if you just put them on and run around your garden, nothing much will happen, right? You, uh, they're, uh, and, and they require training and they require discipline. So it's kind of thing that um, we like to say that um, the your mileage may vary, and the results are likely to be more um, what is it, uh, profound or useful um, if you um, also um, have us help you with them. And that's not a pitch for services, it's just a, we'll give you this stuff and then you'll come back anyway. So uh, some of the guys in the front row here were the people that you would speak to. Um, so thank you. I'm sorry it was a bit long. On the seed and the learning. Mm -hmm. So, how do you recruit a, a, a seed from the barn? From the days, from the sorry, uh, can you maybe flush it out a little bit more? So, it, it's, it's how you do it. Like, so you have you have a, a I think it's the entity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let me move back to the diagram. Yeah. Wow, that's a huge number of slides for that example. So yeah. This one. Yes. So how so how do you recruit uh, things into seed? So anything that's learned now automatically gets to the seed, or you have your own bits? Oh uh, right. So um, so typically. Stuff that's seeded is going to be, you know, the information that's seeded for matching is going to be is going to be higher weighted than anything that we've learned because um, you have to penalize the things you learn because you tend to get drift, right? right? So you'd accumulate context, like for example, you're going to see Obama mentioned as Bami, right, in certain places, right, and you, it's close enough that you'll probably make the match, but the context is not going to be very 
you know, it, it's, it's not going to be very illustrative, right? But if you only had three or four pieces of context and you grab that context and put in, it will sway that cluster. And the next time, it's much more likely to, you know, uh, link Alabama, for example, right? So there are two things you need to be careful about there. Um, what is it? The balance of um, learned and seeding, seeded information, which means roughly the, the, the evidence factoring algorithm is going to throw away, um, you know, a, a certain proportion of things to keep them roughly in balance. So you know, for every four four things we have in the seeded uh, index, we're going to have four learned things, right? Um, and those will be the most often encountered, let's say. So the idea here is to be fairly conservative. Um, it, just to give you an example, uh, uh, very deep connections right, can often be utterly useless right, in the user context because they'll see these documents and they are connected right, and they, they do have a, a valid connection, but they're like, well, uh, especially people who are used to Boolean searches, like, how the hell did this get into my result set? I can't see how that's relevant. And they think it's incorrect. right? So you want to be quite conservative in the way that you um, grow your, um, your linking or discriminating knowledge um, so that it only picks up things that people actually can see the connections between. This is especially true in the government where you know half of a person's uh, research career is my very large, um, what is it, domain specific queries, right, that I've learned over time. So, so, so what's the, what's a typical training cycle? So if, if, you're, if you're training the, the seeded one, mm -hmm. so, how, so when do we know that, hey, the confidence level is a bit high and so now it can Find things for us. Mm. So um, there's a uh, the uh, text analysis conference, which is a you know knowledge base acceleration um, task, as many different tasks now. But there's data sets there that we'd use, um, and when we're performing relatively well on these test sets, right, that's when we'd imagine it's, it's empirical. Is largely what I'm saying. I don't mean that it depends, but you, you um, often have um, there's a little bit of an art, I guess, to figuring out. Uh, when I should start learning, or which bits of the, the new stuff I've seen I should keep. Um, to answer your question. Kind, kind of. So, so, so you have a personal bias as well that sits on top of it. Which, so you say, hey, for my industry, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, so for example, um, if I have Wikidata and a selection that's relevant to a particular domain, right? So, aerospace. Right, um, it's going to do a great job of picking those things up, and hopefully, it'll ignore everything else. Right, um, and then I learn a bunch of new contexts from um, the existing text, or I might put a bunch of documents through it just to see what it will pick up. Right, and then if Matt and I, and this is, I think, a property of the of our system as opposed to others is that it's fully incremental. You give it a document, right, it will give you an answer right away. Um, if it resolves to a null and produces a ghost, then that ghost ghost is there to be linked by the, for the next document, right? Um, so the idea here is that um, that incrementality is very useful, um, meaning you get an answer out and it's up to date. But it can also be um, dangerous because you, you then have to do the pruning every. You have to run the pruning every time something new comes in to make sure that it's not biasing it. The New York Times is known for being fastidious about how they edit. O'Brien with an E, but no, O'Brien with an A, mm -hmm. and print a correction the next day. Mm -hmm. So clearly, if you see something in the New York Times that has a level of accuracy that's way ahead of a lot of other stuff that's on the web, mm -hmm. is there anything that text analytic companies like yours use to say, look, if it comes from here, we're going to treat it more seriously than another source? And so that's one. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, is with more and more social media, if someone does it, does it then also consider the source of a blog? So for instance, if somebody who's like the, the folks from Recode, right, from Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. they blog mm -hmm. versus somebody, you know, who's in Silicon Valley, who's blogging on the side type of thing. Yeah. So I guess, is there any sc scoring for quality or scoring? For so quality? the seeding function, if you like, which takes the, um, uh, the source information abstracts out the parts it needs for matching and for later retrieval, right? Um, can have that bias in it. And in fact, we, we you know, our, our seeding function, um, what is it does that on Wikipedia. So for example, if certain articles are, you know, only new, for example, it will ignore them, right? Um, I'm sorry, if they're, what? if they're very new, for example, it will, it will ignore them, right? You know, it waits until there's a certain amount of um, um, effort that's happened, right? Um, to avoid, mm -hmm. go ahead. You keep mentioning Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I used to work on Wall Street, uh -huh. and, if an, and if an associate ever came to someone in your organization and said, oh, I found this, and I found this on Wikipedia, mm -hmm. 
put your stuff in a box and just just go. Yeah, that kind of prejudice. That kind of prejudice is a little. Uh, I, yeah, sure. Every every information. I mean, even the even the vaunted Times is probably. So I guess what I'm is, if you're using Wikipedia though. Mm -hmm. Is your are the analytic engines then saying okay this comment came from this source and it was added? It probably doesn't do that, does it? Um, okay, you're maybe okay. You're may, maybe so I'm getting a mention from a document, right? And I'm getting right. a little bit of context from that document, right? Okay. And I've seeded from Wikipedia not facts, right, but words that are, and concepts that are associated with that entity. So it doesn't extract facts and say, oh, a Wikipedia article says that this person and this person are connected, or that, right? It's just extracting words because it's associating contexts, right? So unless Wikipedia is so ludicrously you know, overrun with spam, right, then the contexts in Wikipedia, even if the facts are incorrect, are going to be, are going to be roughly right, right? Okay. So yes, to, to answer your question, though, um, um, the seeding function does take into account the quality of the, the sources, right? Um. I have a question about your representation that you mentioned about three methods. This uh, mm -hmm. For the entity extraction part, yeah. Right, right. How do you know which I haven't known what the words are after that. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's filtering on a joint? Yeah. So um, either um, it's what you call knowledge driven, right? So you would have rules which you've used, you've you've usually seen increase the score or improve um, what is it the uh, the entity um, marking, right? Um, or you're learning a model, you know, using a, a second set of annotations, right? Um, uh, which which tends to work well. And again, if you have a balanced set and you're in the right domain and so on and so forth, then that's going to tend to work quite well. So. For example, joining, right? You could have, you could initially just say, well, any given um, extractor uh, or recognizer has equal weight, right? And then um, over time, you could say, well, if I bias this one um, in these contexts, then I tend to do, um, then I tend to do better. So you, you can actually, um, you, you, can, you can actually train fairly decent models on the stuff you already annotated, right? The difficulty comes in. Um, New domains, right? Which you, you don't have annotated data for. Um, some of the, as I mentioned, some of the vocab change. Um, what is it can be handled by doing that unsupervised training? But um, largely speaking, you have to find data, annotate it. Um, you know, have human adjudication. Right? These other, these other, the redactor mechanisms are, are kind of um, overrides, if you like, um, to the to the original recognizers. Um, so there's there's actually a lot of work involved in um, developing goodness. As you could see, um, for example in the biomedical area, right? Um, so extracting drug, gene, et cetera, names, right? Uh, was, it, was quite a while ago now, but it was a very new task, right? A very new set of entities, and they had you know, naming conventions, et cetera, weren't, uh, so you needed an awful lot more data um, in order to properly discriminate them. And then when you were trying to do things like joining, right? Again, because there's no real, uh, there's, there's short-term or, um, um, conventions, if you like, rather than hard and fast rules about a taxonomy, right? Um, so you often ended up having something that was equally biased towards one or other convention that would get it wrong quite a lot of the time. So um, as the domain matures and things become more conventional and all that's left is, um, you know, is uh, easily, um, um, what's the word for it, easily accounted for variation, you know, typos, that sort of thing. Um, these extractors become, and you've seen that, you've probably seen this, these extractors get much more accurate, right? Um, but it's just an accumulation of knowledge. So mostly empirical would be the answer. Trust rankings to sources. Is Um, so, yeah, is there is there a way to assign trust rankings to sources, sources for seeding, or sources for um, you know for resolution, which might eventuate in learned context? Right. So, uh, as I as I said um, to this gentleman, um, part of the seeding function, which is that 
part where I say, I'm looking at this document, I'm looking at the attributes of this document in Wikidata, for example, or Freebase, or one of the other um, authorities, and saying, how old was this article? How many people have edited it? You know, um, et cetera, et cetera. I make a judgment about whether or not to use that article um, based on those criteria, right? So the reason that I'm, I'm not hedging, I'm just saying that you write a specific seeding function for sources, right? So at that time, um, you can take into account things like um, uh, quality, right, or your perceived quality. But I'm not automatically discovering, uh, you know, quality by by any kind of, um, you know, uh, what's worth it, introspective mechanism, right? So I, I could I could programmatically assign them, yeah. I would say that um, again, the mechanism that's actually inside the the, the, the seeding um, the seeded index is multiple um, mentions of the same um, word um, represent the weight. So when I'm actually doing the ranking, right, I'll, I'll I'm counting the words that are, have matched. Right, the count of the words inside the seed represent the weight of that um, uh, uh, of that word or that context. And so you can imagine if there are poor sources. Um, you know, then I'm probably not going to take the words from those sources and they won't be in the seed. So we'll essentially, it's like downvoting that context, right? Um, but like I say, it's quite robust because it's not looking about, it's not facts, right? It's just looking for, you know, associates, if you like, right? Um, which are often the same. I mean, for example, you know, uh, Putin, right? His regular associates, I mean, there may be no end to the lies or pockets of truth around all that stuff, right? But um, the associates are the same associates, right? So if you see Putin mentioned um, with these other people, it's probably that guy, right? Um, which after all is what we're trying to do. So I mean, you can uh, because it's actually so underneath under the hood it's Lucene. A lot of the feature um, evaluation is Lucene, right? So as you probably know, doing update on Lucene records is you know next to impossible. It's designed that way, right? So what we'd probably do is re-index that and add in um, either in another field, um, you know, or in that same field, you know, there'd be a string which would be instead of chem chem W, it would be you know Aero chem W, right? Um, and we'd probably we'd do so for um, each of those. Now when we're when we're reseeding or updating the knowledge base. That would be the time we would do that work, right? Um, so there's a regular updating. Mm -hmm. It's not quite. It's not totally dynamic because I think um, the the point there would be, say, I update some of this information, um, you know. And I've already made um, associations in the past. Uh, you know, I've, I've already made these associations and I've stored them elsewhere. Because all this engine does is say, yep, that thing you gave me is associated with that thing. All those past associations, if you're holding them somewhere, you might want to update them, right? Um, or you might not, just depending. So for example, it's very important to have consistency um, in the, um, and to have uh, temporal notes about when things changed in intelligence, um, what is it, community, right? Because I'm making a judgment based on the information that the system gave me now, right? And then if it changes, I come back and go, oh, well, yes, I swear, yesterday it said, it didn't say that, right? So. Is all this temporally sensitive? Um, no, what this will do is, you give it a word, you give it some words, it will give you an association, right? And then if you update the um, seated index, um, it will give you different associations. However, in order to have that information over time, you're probably persisting that information elsewhere in your application. This, this is a very, um, what's the word for it, uh, tightly constrained uh, piece because we don't want to, uh, I guess, you can't anticipate which applications people will write. So not everybody cares about um, you know, persistence, right? Thank you. So, hi. Is this a, uh, a plug-in or an attachment for C? It's a basis product, and it can be uh, right now. It's um, it, it has it's mostly Java, right? So it's essentially you can it's in it's in late beta now. You can actually download it if you um, send me a note. And I think at the very end there, you've got my uh, email address, um, and uh, it's at point nine. Doo -doo -doo. No, um, Gregor at basistech.com. Uh, com. Um, so this 
so um, all of the other pieces that I mentioned, tokenization, lemmatization, et cetera, you know, the, the, those parts of the stack, um, you know, obviously this plug into um, uh, Lucene Solar, um, Elasticsearch, right? Um, and these can be interfaced in the same way, um, you know, Benson, either through an update request processor or something like that, right? Thank you. Hi. So, so you, I'm sorry, you have been asking there. I, I wonder how you, you started answering part of it. How about time mm -hmm. elements of it? Because the information you had started to answer that by talking about receding, when mm -hmm. maybe significant changes. Yes. So, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, George Bush and President, for instance. Mm -hmm. The information that is you know, before the second Bush mm -hmm. became president, mm -hmm. really the, the meaning would be different than yes. before, you know, President George Bush, you had only one. Yes, that's right. And then you, you started, and, and now if you have a bunch of information from the first President Bush, mm -hmm. You fit into the system. Do you have to time it and, and, and let it know that, no, that, that, that information is... But you did not really mention the, the prior to this time. Yeah. Too much at mm -hmm. all. So I think uh, I think the question is I think the question is again about dynamic knowledge sources, right? So knowledge sources are changing, and you want your decisions that your linking system makes to change along with those knowledge sources. But you may also want to have point in time. So what we knew then, um, you know, would have made would have led us to make this decision, right? Um, but the temporal structure is not inside the module, right? You would have to ha you would have to implement that outside. And again, if I, if I hear that five more times, I guess I could make it a feature. Um, that's how these things work. Sorry. Yeah. So sometimes, uh, so that would be what you call a pipeline error, right? Um, so OPCW may be recognized, uh, you know, simply because it's a, um, a, a, an acronym, right? And then when it has the dots in it, um, the, the dots may be throwing off the lower level extractor because it thinks, oh, I, I don't know what to do with this. It's got dots in it, right? But actually, that's quite a common, um, you can get it, for example, it will pick ones out with three letters, but dots, but it's never seen one with four, so it doesn't tag it. So it's really just a data deficiency issue a lot of the time. So all of the world's acronyms, except for the ones that are in, um, you know, comedy movies, right, are, are within like seven or something, right? So you can imagine we'd feed it more. Just to give you an example of a similar thing, um, so ticker symbols um, were kind of like an annoyance for us, right? Because whether they were in brackets or they had colons or whatever, it just never seemed to work correctly. And then we just actually looked at the training data and said, well, there are only three examples of this, right? Why, why would we we expected to do well, so we went off and annotated, you know, fewer than 300, right, like examples, not documents, right? Um, we suck it in and then it's getting it right, you know, 95% um, you know, of the time. So really, a lot of the time, especially with these um, statistical machines, it's a matter of finding the data, but you're correct. That was an error. Hi. Uh, that's the second most popular question about this. How did it work for short snippets, right? So um, the, you mean like tweets? Right, so queries, yeah. question answering, yeah. So a lot of what's capable of doing is dependent on how well-formed the text is, right? Because it's trained on well-formed text. So it's looking for the, the, the underlying extractor is looking for prose, essentially, right? Um, you use a different technique for shorter text because you can do you can do crazy things like, I'll throw away all the stop words, I'll just create a big list of um, n-grams, right? And then I'll just see if any of those match, right? And if they do, boy, it's great, I'll link them, right? So there's a different technique if you've got very short text, which is why I asked you if you, you were talking about tweets, right? Now, obviously, you get beyond a couple, you know, three sentences maybe in that, that particular technique where you're doing the linking and the extraction in a joint model, right? It doesn't work because it just becomes intractable, right? So then you have to go to the pipeline. But to answer your specific question about the, I'm looking for 12 long stem roses in Cambridge, right? Um, actually, 
even that one sentence is going to pick out Cambridge. It's probably not going to know which. It's probably not going to know which Cambridge it is, frankly, right? Um, because there's no other context. Say, for example, um, uh, you know, Harvard or, or whatever, right? That, that those would be elements that um, would help it pick out that Cambridge. Um, and the 12 long stem roses, right? Um, that's more of a base noun phrase, right? Than a named entity, right? So um, you would expect to have to pause tag that, or um, you know, at least uh, you know, find some other proxy there, and then pick that noun phrase, um, you know, out, out. So it's it's a different extractor, and the noun phrase one could be added, but then you have a more complex, um, you know, adjudication task. You know, this um, twelve long stemmed. Um, there might be a brand name for roses like Lovely, right? Twelve long stemmed Lovely roses, right? Um, and that might have a capital, right? And the extractor might want to cap, might want the statistical extractor might want to bring that out, um, and the BNP would want to have it as a single run, right? Um, so adjudicating there is more difficult. Existing taxonomies. So um, <clears throat> where the taxonomies uh, come in is, so gazetteers, um, which I mentioned at the beginning is a user-defined list of things, right? Taxonomies are often just long lists of, uh, of your company names and so on. So you could have them in there, right? Um, but also, um, if they have a little bit more information, taxonomies can be like what things they're linked to and so on. You might have them in the, uh, as, as one of the seeded knowledge sources, right? So uh, give you an example, a customer of ours is now asking us to resolve uh, Chinese business names, right? And they have an authority list that's very large um, of Chinese business names, right? And it's got little bits of additional information that might help us um, link those. So those will be a source for um, the um, entity resolution system rather than the extractor, right? But yes, to answer the question more generally, um, those kinds of knowledge sources, more like lists, etc., there are at least two places to plug them in uh, and use them. The answer? Standard libraries like OpenNLP in our extraction product. Um, yeah, my understanding that the third, kind of third iteration, we find and then we refine Yes. So on the third iteration, uh, no. So as it turns out, um, all of our um, first-run extractor stuff is is built in-house, and that's just because. Um, the open stuff tends to only have data or you know be associated with the, the the high resource languages and then not too much not too much of that so um, the thing that does the first iteration that extracts the entities um, the statistical model is one that we built right and we don't use any um, we don't use any of the open source or Stanford NLP stuff under the hood stuff we developed yeah. You could use you could use yeah I mean you could use Open NLP or Stanford as a, as as your extractor for the first pass. Uh, you know we wouldn't uh, you know. It, what's my opinion of the e efficacy of those? Accuracy. Um, um, so bear in mind that again I suppose something like which texts, which languages. Uh, you know, with genres, those kinds of things. So, but to be roughly, to, to be, I guess, n not, not brutally honest, but mostly honest, um, you know, it depends how much effort and knowledge you put into them. So, if you took Stanford and you added a whole bunch of really well, really high quality annotated data, it would do very well, right? I think where our special sauce is really more um, the degree to which we can adapt um, the products through knowledge, through redaction rules, etc., is is higher, right? But it's like I said, they're shoes. Uh, they're not, they're not going to make you play basketball like Michael Jordan, right? You have to know how to do that, right? And that's the same, same is true of the Stanford stuff and the Open NLP and so on. Well, what I will say is that uh, one of the major advantages of the things that we've built is that they work together, right? Um, so it's a whole pipeline and um, it's a uniform API, and even with things like Gate, which is a framework for using, um, you know, open source modules like um, uh, like Stanford and, and OpenLP, um, 
can sometimes be a bit clunky, um, although that's sometimes the way that people want to uh, consume them, and we've built connectors for those things too. So did you have two questions there? Was one, am I using any new techniques to extract the entities? Okay, so the result is better is what the customer says is better, right? So uh, I, I'm, I'm serious, like, so they'll, they'll give us data, um, what is it? and they'll say, these are the things I care about. And actually, very often, they will say, I just want it to work. And then we'll say, well, well what does it working mean for you, right? And was, oh, um, well, uh, it has to get this one example right. And then you'll say, well, I'm pretty sure you want more than that. So yeah, and often, it's like pulling teeth to get data. But once, they, once we have um, given them a little bit of education about that, then they have a good idea, actually, of what they want it to do well on. And then it becomes a matter of, well, what are the phenomena that, that these examples are um, you know, relying on? And then what data do we need to put in? Which rules do we need to add to make this work well? Right? It, that, that's primarily the answer to your question, is that it's very customer specific. Um, but we go through a technique. These, these guys go through a technique of figuring out what's not working um, for that, that case. But to answer your question, which is more general, Benson? Measure. Measure. Measure, 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 right? <laughs> so this cycle, right, you know? So, um, but more generally, um, the techniques that we um, are employing now are, are quite different from the ones we started out with, right? So there are many different phenomena that we cover. And the underlying, one of the underlying matchers techniques in the resolution piece um, is a name indexing or name matching technology that we spent many years developing, um, which has a lot of cultural knowledge about how names in one language can be translated to another, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that if I were saying, you know, what's unique, uh, it, it's that kind of stuff. So uh, thank you. We can take one last question. Okay. <laughs> I just need some water, I think. Can I? <laughs> now, usually my wife would say, that's enough now. In, in text analytics, mm -hmm. do you have to do a lot of adjustments for shocks to the system? For example, two weeks ago, we wouldn't have put Robin Williams and depression together. Probably hadn't heard a lot about Ferguson, mm -hmm. and we heard, hadn't heard that much about Ebola. Mm -hmm. So, when shocks like that happen to the system, how much do you have to, to the earlier gentleman's question about George the first, George the second, so you have this, and then suddenly everything changed. Yeah. So, suddenly you have a shock to the system. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with that? So, really, the question. I mean, it's a variant on the temporal. Um, change um, question and also um, is to do with a question of brittleness, right? So yeah. how brittle is the system for any kind of change, right? Um, so the language I feed it changes, okay, it's probably going to break, right? right. So um, the, the, re the answer there I think is um, if we notice um, that certain things aren't being uh, correctly linked, so it's, okay. Then, as Benson said, um, you know, we have measurement, right, that tells us, oh, well, you know, uh, we have these sets that the customers care about, and those will change over time, right? And they're not, they're not being linked correctly. Okay, let's go back, right? Okay. Um, Benson? I guess the only amplification that I offer there is nothing we've built for course to be a big stand-up, turn-on, and stand-back for the next five years and get high-quality answers. No, and no. Any, and, and we don't know how to build that. We don't really think anybody else does either. Yeah. And so, yes, if you hit it over the head with a big enough wheel, uh, you know, it will... It will wobble, right. <laughs> right. You, might have, you might have to scramble. We do try to make it resilient. But if the example you gave, I'd be pretty frightened of Ferguson. Because yeah. I would imagine that having read and having ingested everything available to us until this all started, yeah. we would I could think of a, many things we might propose as links for Ferguson, but very few of them would be municipalities outside of, uh, of, uh, of St. Louis. The Robin Williams depression non-linkage is not a big deal because that link would just appear in the system as the news came in. But, but the first
Ferguson situation would have to get over a big hump of existing yeah. pointers in other directions. And we don't have a solution to that. Right? Yeah. And, and that's the and that's the, the pruning issue. So like Benson well, says we too, I'm not I'm saying it's it's a challenge for anybody who's doing text analytics, it's like boom, you just had a meteor. What do you mm -hmm. what do you do? How do you deal with it? Right. And I I I'm not, I, I hope I don't sound too defensive, but I'm mostly trying to I, I'm very proud of the fact that we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And I'm very clear on the fact that we don't do that yet. Yeah. <laughs> So actually, that kind of supervision and update, um, you know, is usually going to be driven by the knowledge sources. And the more, the closer we get to dynamic knowledge sources, the less of a problem we'll have. Right? Okay. Yeah, cool. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.